Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020. And on this episode, I'm once again talking about the Supreme Court, not the current, necessarily the current political debate over who said what or who's going to nominate who. I'm not covering any of that, but we're going to instead go back in history because it's important for us if we want to understand the problems that we face, the bleak, the terrible uh, state of the Constitution, especially through the Supreme Court itself, we need to understand some of the things that we were warned about, how it might play out in practice. And for that, I want to go back to the Anti-Federalists who were consistent, along with Thomas Jefferson, consistent in warning that the Supreme Court, the federal court system, would lead to a consolidated government and total tyranny. First of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. It's long, but it's pretty easy peasy. There you're going to find everything you need to follow this program. All the platforms are on both video, like uh, YouTube, Facebook, DLive, Library, Twitch, etc., Periscope, and then also the audio-only podcast platforms. For example, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Spit Stitcher, uh, TuneIn, iHeartRadio. We're on Amazon now. I haven't had a link for that yet, but hopefully we'll be on a few others in the near future. In essence, we want to reach you where you prefer to be and we want to be on as many platforms as possible. So if we get kicked off of one, we've got backup. So find all that information and more, like our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. A quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. I really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, some great feedback on the intro. I'm glad you guys like that. Made that one a few years ago through a template, but just kind of modified it for our uh uh, our message, uh, fucking euphemism, says that Kyle Reese over on Periscope. I want to say hi to Clay Davis. Good to see you, buddy. Bob Landry, Josh Irwin, Taco Salad, Tim Martin, Jim Knowlton. Uh, let's see who else. Earl Davis, Dean Plackis, Daniel Snowden. Good to see you, buddy. And Richard Banks down in for, oh, over in Fredonia, Kansas. And I apologize if I missed anybody. I want to just kind of dive right to this. Oh, quick hello to Blue North Wind. Good to see you again. And I appreciate your feedback on the Starry Decisis episode, which I will cite again. That was from Monday. Anyways, let's get right to this. And I want to start out with a guy that I've often... Well, no, first, actually, let me back that up. I want to start out with some testimony that Ilya Shapiro gave. This was published over at the Cato Institute yesterday, I believe. And here's what he, how he puts it, talking about the political debate over the Supreme Court that happens right now. And the reason that we have it, he says, the reason we have these heated court battles is that the federal government is simply making too many decisions at a national level for such a large, diverse, and pluralistic country. And I don't know if he's intending to sound like a tenth or if he's intending to sound like Samuel Adams or George Mason or Patrick Henry or Thomas Jefferson. But the fact of the matter is, is we were told that the only way, in essence, and I'm going to paraphrase a bunch of people, the only way that you could have such a large country, and even at the time of the founding, it was a very large country with a diverse range of political, economic, and religious viewpoints. Virginia was far different from Massachusetts at the time, no doubt about that. Their history and traditions, their way of life, and it's even more so in states like California to South Carolina today. The only way you can live in this large type of a country without having a low-grade civil war all the time is allow people to make the decisions that best fit them in their own area. Thomas Jefferson warned us, for example, that the judiciary was going to act as the engine of consolidation, the engine of centralization of power, and the other two branches would act as the corrupting influences. That's how he saw it in the 1820s. And again, he put it this way as well in a letter to Charles Jarvis, William Charles Jarvis, in September of 1820. He said, you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions of very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. If every single thing under the sun 
is a national issue to be sided by the federal government. It's not really a federal government anymore, not even close. The central government, the national government, if every issue is going to be dealt with on a national level, then all the most divisive issues are going to be packed into the Supreme Court. Pun intended there. But that's, and then the Supreme Court, because they are outside of their original jurisdiction, are going to make political pronunciations, political pronouncements, or act like I mentioned on Monday's episode about precedent, stare decisis, precedent over the Constitution. They're going to make political dicta. They're going to make political viewpoints public in their opinions. And instead of applying the facts of the case and the law at the hand, the supreme law of the land, all the courts in the country are then going to follow their political opinion. So we've turned this into a political tool with a super legislature that should never have existed in this way in the first place. In fact, we were told that it was dangerous and it might end up this way. Now, certainly some people weren't fully convinced of that and they went with it anyways. Uh, but Jefferson, just a few decades later, was recognizing that it was a centralizing force. Now, I know we're talking about anti-federalists and I know a lot of people think Jefferson was an anti-federalist and a lot of people think he absolutely was not an anti-federalist. But I want to quick just cite him because this is one that I talk about so often, centralizing influence and, of course, the oligarchic nature of the Supreme Court. Now, here, just a quick side note. This is a letter in his own words to Francis Hopkinson in March of 1789. He says, I am neither Federalist nor anti-federalists, that I am of neither party nor yet a trimmer between parties. I will link to that full article in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I encourage you to read it. He specifically talks about how he may have been closer to the federalist side right off the bat, uh, but he's not on either team. But I think the message is exactly the same. Now with that, let's go uh, to Aaron Coleman, who wrote a great article, and he's done a bunch of really, really good stuff on federalism and the original Constitution here over at Law and Liberty. His article is Anti-Federalists and the Roots of Judicial Oligarchy. I read it uh, through a tip from Dave Benner, who's just awesome. I think Dave had posted it and was talking about it on social, maybe on Facebook or something. And then, so uh, I saved it. I'm like, there's gotta be a point in time where we're gonna have to talk about the Supreme Court a lot. Didn't expect what we're having today, uh, but this is how he put it. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, and he's primarily targeting this at lawliberty.org to a conservative legal audience, but I think it applies to anyone. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, conservatives continue to tout Hamilton's assurances, Hamilton, which I mentioned, Federalist 78, Federalist 81, and elsewhere I mentioned in Monday's episode, which I will reference here, I'll include a link in the show notes as well, but that the judiciary was not going to be dangerous. All the assurances that with the right people in place, and that's what it relies on, getting the right people in place. The judiciary would prove to be the, quote, least dangerous branch. That was Hamilton's term because it had neither force nor will, while the absence of the sword and the purse were to render the court powerless. History, Aaron writes, and he's so it's so important to reiterate this because we have to understand what we're facing. We have to understand what we are warned about to be able to change how we deal with it going forward. History, he says, has not been so sanguine. Gwen, I believe that's how you pronounce Sanguine to Hamilton's assurances. It's not right. So it talks about the expansion of executive power, the delegation doctrines, lack of practical limitations about congressional authority, the decline of federalism, social issues, abortion, marriage, everything. It becomes a political question before the Supreme Court to force through the incorporation doctrine on all 50 states. He goes on. He says, this bleak picture, maybe I've got that in the next one. Yeah, this bleak picture of our modern constitutionalism should not surprise anyone who has read the Anti-Federalists. Now, when I talk about the stuff that I read early on when I was, I guess, transitioning from self-proclaimed Marxist, a bad one, albeit, uh, to wherever I am today, someone who looks to decentralization to advance individual liberty, I guess, but one of the first books that I ever read, I read two early on from the founders. One was John Adams' early political work, and I learned a lot of the great stuff. I didn't know how bad he was later on for many years. But I also read Saul Cornell's The Complete Anti-Federalist, which really wasn't complete. I think it was actually published sometime in the 80s or early 90s, something like that. But that's how I was introduced to constitutionalism, at least through my own reading. 
Uh, Coleman goes on, he says, there are warnings on the loss of self-governance and liberty through the Constitution's general vices. Now, there was a lot of concern about this, and everyone recognized that there would be a more consolidating influence, but they felt, on one side, they felt the checks and balances, and then the people of the several states would actually do their job. Unfortunately, we've mostly lacked the people of the several states doing their jobs, but that's another episode. But everyone recognized there was a potential for more consolidation, and the great warnings were, uh-oh, we can't trust where this is going to go. Patrick Henry very famously said, and I'm going to cite Patrick Henry on the judiciary quite a bit, but he famously said in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, you know, show me that age and country where the people trusted their rulers to be good men without a subsequent loss or a consequent loss of liberty. And that is a paraphrase, but they expected consolidation. And the vices of the judiciary in particular, Aaron writes, should appear to modern readers those willing to listen at any rate, as prophetic and prescient. Now, let's look at some of the things that Aaron quotes from the Anti-Federalists. He has a section in the article, Anti-Federalists and Judicial Oligarchy. I encourage you to actually read the whole article, which I will link in the show notes. He says, many Anti-Federalists foresaw the coming of judicial supremacy. And I've seen some quotes on our scheduled event on social last night and then already coming in, people talking about Brutus. And Brutus probably was the most prominent. And I'm going to get to Brutus for sure here a little bit as well. As all constitutional questions fell under the court's domain, Brutus, one of the most prominent Anti-Federalist writers, saw that members of the court could, quote, enlarge the exercise of their powers. This is, in essence, what Jefferson and Madison warned us about in the uh, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of 1798 against the hated and unconstitutional alien and sedition acts of that year, signed, of course, by John Adams. So they basically said, when you rely on the federal government to police itself, when you go to the federal government to limit the powers of the federal government, and that is your recourse into somehow keeping the federal government within the bounds of the Constitution, you should not be surprised when that power grows. No matter who's in the Supreme Court, no matter what political party's in charge, no matter what person's in the White House, that's how it's going to play out. And that's, in essence, what Brutus was warning about. They could enlarge the exercise of their own powers and make it, quote, superior to the other branches of the governments. This was in Brutus paper number 11, I'm pretty sure. Nothing, Aaron writes, provided in the Constitution, oh, and he's citing Brutus again, can correct their errors or control their adjudications. From this, there is no appeal. No appeal at all. When they screw up, they screw up for everybody. And now when we combine that with the doctrine of stare decisis precedent, which I'm not going to get into now, but I just got to keep mentioning, because once you have bad precedent and you have precedent upon precedent upon precedent, and then you have incorporation where the Supreme Court makes the decisions on everything for all the country, all the states, all the time, then of course every bad decision becomes that much worse. Going further, Brutus said, every adjudication of the Supreme Court on any question that may arise upon the nature and extent of the general government will affect the limits of the state jurisdiction. They warned Brutus specifically that through the Supreme Court, the federal government's power would expand and it would infringe upon the state line, the lines of the state power as reserved by the 10th Amendment, by the Constitution itself to the people of the several states. Aaron goes on, as a creature of the Constitution, the court would invariably, and he quotes Brutus again, lean strongly in favor of the general government. Surprise, surprise, an agent of the federal government taking the sides of the federal government. My buddy Tom Woods for years had this great analogy. If you're talking about relying on the Supreme Court to protect you from the federal government, the federal courts to protect you from the federal government, this is like having a divorce proceeding and going to your mother-in-law to adjudicate who's right and who's wrong. Now, maybe... The mother-in-law thinks you're a really good person and is going to be really honest. But would you trust that setup? And in essence, I mean, maybe mother and father are the right, because we're not talking about a parent-child relationship here, but it's the connection, the connection between the federal courts and the rest of the federal government. Now, we can all say, well, Woods made that up. Bolden, what are you talking about? But we know that at least some prominent people were thinking this already 
in 1787, 1788, 1789, they were talking about this. This would happen. If you have a federal court determining the extent of the powers of the federal government, it would lean strongly in favor of the general government and will give such an explanation to the Constitution as will favor an extension of its jurisdiction. What a surprise, right? Well, Brutus wasn't alone. George Mason was another. He says, when we consider, and this was in the Virginia Ratifying Convention in June of 1788, this was one of the most prominent places in Virginia during the ratification debates, one of the most prominent places where they discussed the judiciary. And Mason and others, Patrick Henry, I'll cite a few others, talked about this in quite a lot of detail. He says, when we consider the nature of these courts, George Mason, we must conclude that their effect and operation will be to utterly destroy the state governments, for they will be the judges how far their laws will operate. Well, George Mason looked at this and said, well, the checks and balances aren't enough in the federal government. Of course, it takes something outside the federal government to limit the power of the federal government. And if you're relying on the feds to do it, he said, look, it's going to destroy the state governments. And even though they still exist today, in essence, most of what the federal government does today is in partnership with the state. So really, the states are not acting like a federal structure. They're acting like oversized counties, maybe some home rule. They do a few things here and there, but they really act as tools of the federal government. That's George Mason. A few days later, here's Patrick Henry. He says, the manner in which the judiciary and other branches of the government are formed seems to be calculated to lay prostate, prostrate the states and the liberties of the people. And maybe there was something nefarious there. I've talked about Hamilton and Madison doing flip-flops. Hamilton originally, before the Constitution was ratified, he sold the ratifiers in New York State on the idea that power would be expressly delegated and you couldn't go beyond that bounds. But then soon as the ratification was done, he made all kinds of uh, arguments in support of a general power, a general power to do whatever they want, specifically a national bank. Madison, on the other hand, he wanted the federal government to act as one consolidated government in what he drafted as the Virginia plan. And in fact, he called for specifically a national veto power over every act of the state legislature. But then a year later, after the Constitution was ratified, he didn't get what he wanted. So I think he I honestly think he was just being consistent, like I didn't get what I wanted, but I'm really on board with this Constitution idea. So I'm going to sell it for what it is. But who knows? Maybe it was. Maybe it was. There was a lot of debate between Patrick Henry and James Madison in this on this issue in the Virginia ratifying convention. So maybe Patrick Henry was onto something. You guys really just designed this to really destroy the power of the states and the liberties of the people. I, I don't know. Going further, that was Patrick Henry. And here, the descent of the minority of the Pennsylvania Convention. The Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention was really, the Constitution was really railroaded through. During the ratification debates, it was a pretty quick thing. They knew the vote was going to be, I think, 46 to 23 before it started. It ended up being 46 to 23. Everybody was on partisan lines. They knew exactly how it was going to play out. But there was a lot of concern about what the general public would hear. And the supporters of the Constitution really played dirty pool. They did a lot of cancel culture. They prevented opposing views from getting published in local papers. And so there was a lot of concern that the if this process was used in other states, that uh, the whole thing was going to be doomed. And they talked about that. Madison, Washington, and others talked about that in letters after the fact. But after it was uh, voted for ratification in Pennsylvania, finally, the, the anti-federalists were able to publish some of their views. And they did in the Pennsylvania packet on December 18th, 1787. One of the first things that they put, the second paragraph, their dissent about why they were opposing the Constitution was the judicial powers. And they put it this way, the judicial powers vested in Congress are also so various and extensive that by legal ingenuity, they may be extended to every case and thus absorb the state judiciaries. I mean, so many issues today, we see people immediately going to federal court, 
always going, it, everything's a federal court issue. And when the state courts do something, it's just a stepping stone to get it into the federal court system, which just centralizes their power even further. So the short term goal of, well, I don't like how my state's working. I'm going to go to the feds in the hope that the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the world is going to somehow protect me from this local offshoot that gets tons of funding from that same organization. It's really, really bad in the long run for liberty. They also warned, they said, when we consider the decisive influence that a general judiciary would have over the civil polity of the several states, we do not hesitate to pronounce that this power, unaided by the legislative, would affect a consolidation of the states under one government. Next up is William Grayson. In again, in Virginia, June 21st, 1788, he says this court has more power than any court under heaven. It's the most powerful court ever created, according to William Grayson. One set of judges ought not to have this power and judges particularly who have temptation always before their eyes. He's talking about the largest power under heaven ever in a, in a single body of judges. And this is him in Virginia, but we're going to have a very similar argument about this from New York a little bit later. Back to Patrick Henry. How did he put it? He says, it appears to me that the powers in this section before you, again, talking about the judicial clause, are either impracticable or, if reducible to practice, dangerous in the extreme. We can also jump down to North Carolina, where Samuel Spencer, also in the summer of 1788, he's got objections to the article about the Supreme Court. He says, I object to the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal court in all cases of law and equity arising under the Constitution uh, and the laws of the United States. And the appellate jurisdiction, that was a big complaint about the appellate jurisdiction of controversies between the citizens of several states and a few other instances. He sums it up like this, Samuel Spencer to these, I object because I believe they will be oppressive in their operation. That certainly was prophetic. Absolutely oppressive in their operation. Even if in theory, in principle, it's supposed to play out a different way. I think Jefferson specifically, and this is a quick side note, even though, again, we're, we're making clear Jefferson was not an anti-federalist or a federalist. Jefferson was very clear in saying, look, when the Supreme Court does stuff that it's not supposed to do, you have to rely on the people and the states to reject and resist them. James Madison, in his report of 1800, talking about the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 against the Alien and Sedition Acts, he says, look, this resolution supposes what we all understood, that not only will the executive and legislative branches have a tendency towards unconstitutional acts, but the judicial power as well. And when you have all three parts of the federal government doing stuff that they're not supposed to do. You have to have the states. The states are duty inbound, in duty bound to interpose to arrest the progress of the evil, the evil being the unconstitutional act. So Patrick Henry, Spencer, Samuel Spencer, William Grayson, and so many others, George Mason. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is Samuel Jones up in New York. And Samuel along with maybe Melanchthon Smith, uh, Robert Yates, and a few others. Uh, John Williams were probably the leading thinkers for the anti-federalist cause. They were very well read. They weren't the standard back country farmer type. I mean, certainly there was that, but they were very powerful speakers and well-written, well-read, and all that, well understood. But they were so opposed in New York to this that in committee, while considering ratification of the Constitution, this is again the uh, summer of July of 1788, they put a series of resolutions out there. And here's resolution number nine. Resolved as the opinion of this committee that the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the United States or of any other court to be instituted by the Congress ought not in any case to be increased, enlarged, or extended by any fiction, collusion, or mere suggestion. I mean, that's basically what we have today. The, the power of the Supreme Court and therefore the power of Congress and the executive branch have all been enlarged, enlarged by fiction, collusion, and just mere suggestion. They were con so concerned about this happening in the judiciary that they actually put a formal resolution to say, we got to make sure that this doesn't happen. That was uh, put forward by Samuel Jones. 
on July 5th of 1788. Let's go back to George Mason, and this is kind of a precursor to what we know as qualified immunity today. The idea that if you go to court to, in essence, sue an agent of the government who violated your rights, the odds are so stacked against you that it's almost a waste of time. George Mason was recognizing this as a problem already on the state level, and he was concerned that the centralizing, the consolidating power of the federal judiciary would lead to making it almost impossible. And here's how he put it. Again, Virginia Ratifying Convention, he says, we know the difficulty we are put in by our own courts and how hard it is to bring officers to justice, even in them. He says, if any of the federal officers should be guilty of the greatest oppressions or behave with the most insolent and wanton brutality to a man's wife or daughter. Where's this man to get relief? Or the wife or daughter, for that matter. Let's not forget that, George Mason. But basically, the, the agents of the federal government being protected by the federal courts, the odds of them ever uh, having justice when they are committing violence and oppression against the people, against the Constitution, against their liberties, he didn't expect it to happen. And he certainly was prophetic for what we face today under the so-called doctrine, the legal fiction created out of thin air by the Supreme Court, the doctrine of qualified immunity. Let's go back to Brutus. Here's Brutus number 12. This was in February of 1788. And Brutus, there's a little, there's some question about who actually wrote these. I've heard some people say it was Robert Yates, but most researchers will tell you it was either Melanchthon Smith or John Williams of New York. There's some back and forth. There's some similarities in the language, but it doesn't really matter. It was primarily for a New York audience. And here in number 12, he says, it's easy to see that in their adjudications, the courts, again, they may establish certain principles, which being received by the legislature will enlarge the sphere of their power beyond all bounds. He was warning that because of the nature of the Supreme Court being part of the federal government and having jurisdiction in all these areas, it would enlarge the powers of Congress. And we know that once that happens, everything goes off the rails. And then he starts talking about precedent. He says, in determining these questions about constitutionality, he says, the court must and will assume certain principles from which they will reason in forming their decisions. These principles, whatever they may be, when they become fixed by a course of decisions, will be adopted by the legislature and will be the rule by which they explain their own powers. In the short version, he was concerned about precedent overriding the original supremacy of the Constitution itself, because once they enlarge their own power, it becomes a series, a train of actions. And if the court keeps doing this, then the legislature will assume that to be the way that they can behave. And this is exactly how it has played out in practice. Now, here's some predictions from Brutus. This is a good article from Gary Gallus over at Foundation for Economic Education. He said that they pre Brutus predicted that the Supreme Court would adopt very liberal principles of interpretation. Basically, just kind of just go to town on it. A changing, a living, breathing constitution, he warned about. Because there never had been in history a court with such immense powers. Immense powers, that was Brutus's term which was perilous for a nation founded on the consent of the government. Gary goes on, he says, it could easily empower creative rulings, creative from Brutus, with force of law. That's again Brutus, due to insufficient ability to control their adjudication and correct their er errors. This failing would compound over time in a silent and imperceptible manner, through precedents building on one another. So if we're concerned about stare decisis, we're concerned about the fact that the court treats precedent as more important than the history and the text of the Constitution itself, we know that we didn't come up with that just from our learned experience because we've watched this play out. We should know this because we were told this is exactly how it was going to play out right from the beginning. Gary puts it this way, he says, in summary, Brutus argued that overly broad judicial readings would empower justices to shape the federal government and its limits as they desired over time. It would be piece by piece, brick by brick, setting a foundation for the centralized monster state we live under today. He says, regardless of the Constitution's words, because the court's interpretations 
would remake them. And that is, I guess it's a good time for me to bring up Monday's episode, which if you haven't checked out, really ties in very closely to these warnings about precedent, because the whole episode was about stare decisis, the doctrine of precedent, the doctrine that precedent is more important than the Constitution probably most of the time. Supreme Court precedent and the Constitution. that It's the doctrine that a court should rule the way a previous court did, even when the judges of the second court disagree with the judges of the earlier court. I will link to that in the show notes. Please do check that out when you have a chance. And speaking of John Williams, potential author of Brutus, here's how he put it. And it sounds very similar to what what Brutus was having to say, but it was a very consistent message, whether it was uh, Melanchthon Smith or Yates or Henry or Mason or the Philadelphia minority. He says, ingenious men, and this was in the New York ratifying convention, arguing with Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was saying, you don't have anything to worry. And this, I don't know if this was specifically about judiciary, but it was a general consensus that Hamilton's telling them, like, look, this is how it's uh, set up. And Williams is like, wait a second. You're telling me that today, but down the line, someone is going to use this vague language, this potentially broad language, and use it to destroy the states, to destroy our liberty, and go way beyond the bounds of the Constitution. He says, ingenious men may may assign ingenious reasons for opposite constructions of the same clause. And a quick summary here. From Brutus, this is number 15 in March of 1788. He says, there is no power above them to control any of their decisions. There is no authority that can remove them and they cannot be controlled by the laws of the legislature. And he even did talk about impeachment, but said that, you know, it's just it's just very narrow to get impeached for just a, a small expansion of power is almost impossible. They knew it wasn't going to happen, and it certainly has not happened in the last two plus centuries. Brutus goes on, he said, in short, they are independent of the people, of the legislature, and of every power under heaven. There's that phrase again. He says, men placed in this situation will generally soon feel themselves independent of heaven itself. Man, absolutely prophetic was Brutus and so many others. Or here's Dr. Samuel Willard in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He says, where power had been trusted to men, whether in great or small bodies, they had always abused it. That power was always abused. And the Anti-Federalists, and many of the Federalists recognize this as well. They just thought that they could create a system that would uh, play out a little bit differently. But we have to understand the arguments against, to understand the nature of power, of consolidation. Power corrupts, we know this. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the old Lord Acton quote. But all power is going to be abused. It doesn't have to be absolute power to be abused. And that's what Dr. Willard was talking about in Massachusetts. He knows that any time power was trusted to people, they would always abuse that power. So you can't rely uh, on the fate of your liberty on people being good and just voluntarily staying within uh, their limits. A quick hello to everyone out in the live chat again, I want to see if I'm going to see if uh, there's some good questions or anything. Super i5 is crushing like usual. Keep up the good work, man. I'm just doing my best to kind of put together all these pieces to share a message that was very consistent from a number of people in different states over a, a period of a few years and just kind of put that all together so we can all share it together. But of course, I'm just scratching the surface. And as Erwin Havernick says, he says, I'm going to go to the show notes this evening, George Mason, Patrick Henry. I generally don't publish those for about, lately it's been about an hour or so after the live stream is done. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash Path to Liberty. I will include links to all the original documents that I'm citing here, even uh, whether it's a speech by George Mason or Patrick Henry or the links to the Brutus uh, letters, all of that stuff will be in there so you can actually read the full context. I mean, if we're talking about uh, an 800 word speech or a 10 minute speech or a letter or something like that, and I'm just citing a couple of sentences to summarize, I'm really just scratching the surface. Blue North Wind says most of the female candidates chose stare decisis over the Constitution. Basically, anyone, anyone who is going to be considered is generally in support of this garbage. And we can't rely on the Supreme Court to protect our liberty. We know We know that there has to be something else. And that's what Patricia Dance asks over on YouTube. Good to see you, Patricia. Then with all this in mind, is there a remedy? We were asked by someone over on our Instagram 
page. You can send us direct messages to Instagram. You can send us uh, direct messages to our Facebook account. You can email us at team at 10th Amendment Center .com. You can text us 213-935-0553. All these places where you can reach out to us. We read all the feedback, uh, reply to just a small portion of it, but all the feedback is very great. But someone actually was asking like, well, it sounds like you're saying that, the, you know, the federal government in essence is a lost cause. You can't fix it through the federal government. Well, of course, under the situation that we live in today, when all power flows to Washington, D.C., there has to be something outside of Washington, D.C. to fix Washington, D.C. Jefferson, Madison, and many others told us that would be the people of the several states. It is up to the people to resist unconstitutional acts, not try to vote the bums out in the hopes that the new bums would come in and turn down all that power left for them. Clay Kent says, thank you for hiding the, the anti-federalist papers. They are sadly ignored, including by yours truly, for way too long. And there's been so many things where I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good quote. But I'm doing better on my own personal research, so I think I'm better able to compile some of these thoughts. thoughts. I really, really appreciate you mentioning that, Clay. I expect to have much more from them on various issues going forward, because if we really want to understand the Constitution, what the founders were talking about. You can't just read the Federalist. You can't just rely on Hamilton, Jay, and Madison to say, well, this is how things are supposed to be. If you don't also understand warnings or concerns about how things might not be or how things could end up, how can you ever fix it? How can you ever understand the real problem? Now, Jefferson said he was way closer to the Federalist than he was anti-Federalist, even though he wasn't on either side. Uh, but that, you know, if you only understand one piece of it, you're never, ever going to get there. <laughs> Funky Uvman says, who would use Instagram with a crazy evil spine that has just been uncovered? I I mean, we're going to use whatever people want us to use. But yes, the, it is a the biggest problem in my mind is that all of these organizations, once they collect this data, they're handing it off to the NSA, to the DHS, to the federal government. Going a little further, just reading a few more in the chat. Kyle Reese talks about resumption clauses in ratifying documents. That actually would make for an interesting episode on its own. I appreciate you mentioning that, New York and Virginia. Brian McClanahan was talking about this yesterday. I'm always like a week behind on Brian's stuff, but if, uh, if that's a good recommendation, I'm assuming it is. I've learned a lot from Brian over the years, and when he's talking about history and debates over the Constitution, the dude is rock solid. He's really, really good, and even if you don't agree with where he ends up on things, he's going to make you think about the process to get from point A to point B. Same with Kevin Gutsman, same with Woods, same with many others who I've learned with as well. Erwin Havernick says, I'm with the minority on that dissent. That was the minority of the Pennsylvania Convention. And of course, if we're keeping in mind that they were actually threatening papers during the debate saying, don't publish this stuff. I guess one guy actually got fired from his job for trying to publish something or maybe he succeeded in publishing one letter. Uh, then we understand why there was such strong opposition. Funky Uvabin says, <laughs> Patrick Henry did come around in the Madisonian sense as a Federalist. That's well, Patrick Henry, that would be another awesome episode. I appreciate you've actually given me a bunch of ideas, uh, funky for some episodes. Going a little further, tamps down the 10th. I'm going to read through these a little bit later. Anyways, I really, really appreciate all your feedback. I appreciate you spending some time with me today. Please continue leaving comments later on in the archive or now live. I will read through all of them later and reply to as many as I'm humanly able to do so. Sometimes it's only a handful, depending on what's going on. You can also support us by smashing the like, uh, subscribing, getting bell notifications on YouTube, leaving a review on iTunes or any other pl podcast platform helps a ton. It helps us spread the word. It tells the algorithm of the platform to show the program to more people, and it's really working. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you to all our members that are out here. I see more. Actually, we always have a lot. Oh, good to see EHP training. Good to see you, buddy. Been a while since we saw you uh, here on the live chat. Uh, I'm sure you've been checking us out when you're able to. But a lot of members out there that I'm very grateful for. We could not do this work, this research, uh, our activism in support of the Constitution and in, in support of nullification and support of liberty without the financial faith of our members. Do not feel obligated to join them as well. But if you can consider it, it starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Thanks again for spending some of your time with me today. I hope this was it educational. That's more important than anything. I hope you learned something. I'll have all the original source documents linked in the show notes in a little while. 
I hope you have a great day and I'll see you on Friday here on the path to liberty.